and delighted to introduce you to our last author of this two days, Elizabeth Price Foley, who has written a book on the Tea Party, Tea Party Three Principles. You make the point that the Tea Party is not a party, it is a movement. What's the distinction that's worth knowing about? Yeah, well, it's, it's not a party in the sense that it, it has no interest in anointing some sort of central leader. Uh, it really is a movement that's defined by what I uh, talk about in the book, three very clear, very old constitutional principles. So uh, you've noticed that the Tea Party, you know, through the November 2010 elections and, and continuing to today, has been sort of ruthless about uh, throwing its support behind candidates who espouse these principles. And, and they don't really care much whether those candidates have an R or a D after their name. And they certainly don't seem to care that they might be uh, well entrenched, well funded uh, incumbent Republicans. So uh, all they care care about is getting their principles uh, embraced by our politicians. And in fact, the uh, you say the media makes the mistake by thinking that the Tea Party is non-existent in this cycle, that because we don't see an organized movement that in fact their influence is waning. What are you finding? Yeah, I, I think the Tea Party is still very much sort of alive and well and living in the suburbs, if you will. Um, I've been to several Tea Party events in recent months. Uh, and even though they're not, you know, sort of uh, marching in the streets anymore, a lot of people think they're dormant or perhaps even dead because of that. Uh, but when I talk to them, you know, their, their response is, uh, been there, done that. Uh, we don't want to march anymore. We're trying to mature as a movement. We're trying to spend our time wisely and infiltrate, uh, you know, the existing establishment, the existing system to get them to, to come our way. So I do think come November, a lot of people are going to be surprised. They're going to show up in droves. Uh, and a lot of them, frankly, are going to be pulling that lever, uh, not so much because they uh, love, for example, Mitt Romney, who appears to be the uh, uh, nominee for the Republicans, uh, but because they're opposed to President Obama's policy. So you'll see a lot of anti-Obama votes, just like you saw a lot of anti-Bush votes in 2008. Elizabeth Foley lives in Miami, and she is a constitutional law professor. This is her third book. And we'd like very much to involve you in the conversation. And we've got about 25 minutes to do so. We're going to put the book TV phone numbers on the screen, East uh, and Central time zones, Mountain and Pacific time zones. And if you'd like to send us a question by email or tweet us a question, you can do that as well. Well, uh, so people understand your perspective. Tell us a, a more than I just did about yeah. yourself. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a constitutional law professor by trade. I've been teaching it for 15 years. And I have to tell you, sometime around the spring, summer of 2009, I give sort of public speeches to various groups, Rotarians, uh, Great Panthers, people like that. I had a bunch of people coming up to me afterwards with, um, with pocket constitutions. Don't know if you've ever seen them, but I, I rarely see them outside of a law school building. And I started seeing them all the time. And these people were asking me sort of intelligent questions about very specific clauses. And it dawned on me about three months into that, that these were the Tea Partiers that I'd been hearing about. Uh, and they just defied the stereotype that I'd been reading about in the mainstream media. So I wanted to do a lot more research about who they really were and what made them tick. Uh, and it turns out that they uh, are a movement of, of constitutional conservatism and fiscal conservatism. Uh, they're not the conservatives of the Reagan era. They don't seem to be very interested in social issues like gay marriage or abortion. Uh, and as a constitutional law professor, that intrigued me that ordinary Americans were finally interested in our Constitution. Uh, you yourself have gone through a political journey in your lifetime. Right. You talked about the fact that you worked on Capitol Hill and worked for Democrats. So uh, yeah. d tell me about your own migration and thinking over time. Yeah, it was sort of a slow metamorphosis. You know, it wasn't like Franz Kafka where I woke up and I, you know, I changed. Um, but I, I went to law school after having worked on the Hill. So uh, when I worked on the Hill, I, I, I did what my boss told me to do, like most good Hill staffers do. And I, I didn't really think much about the Constitution. Uh, I certainly didn't think about whether or not uh, Congress had the constitutional authority to enact the bills that I was writing on behalf of my bosses. Uh, and then I went to law school and I realized for the first time in my life that uh, our federal Congress doesn't have the power to pass any kind of law at once. I thought they did. Uh, and I graduated from a top tier university in, the, in this country. Uh, and if I, don't, if I didn't know that after being highly educated, I bet a lot of other people didn't either. It took law school for me to realize that. And I think once you realize that, that we have a constitution of limited and enumerated powers only, you have to sort of take that more seriously. And from there, uh, you know, still being someone who cared a lot about liberty, rather than becoming a pure conservative, I decided I was sort of more of a libertarian. The Tea Party, uh, its critics suggest that it is racist. 
uh, and you've spent time with people. What is your conclusion about them overall? I mean, it's hard to generalize about a movement with thousands yeah. of people, but. Yeah, it's, a, it's an umbrella organization. I think that's one of the biggest sort of disservices we've, we've done to the Tea Party is, is here's a group that if demographically, they have the same percentage of non-whites as the general population in this country. Most people don't realize that. They think they're you know, disproportionately white. Uh, it's simply not true. Uh, they also, when you look at what they, what they care about, what they care about is limited government. They care about uh, reining in sort of unbridled power and unbridled spending. Uh, and, and so they're not motivated by race. Yes, they're opposed to President Obama's policies. They're very frustrated and angry at the bailout, bailout, bailout. And then they're also frustrated. I think the straw that broke their camel's back, if you will, was health care reform. Uh, but their opposition to health care reform wasn't based on the fact that the president was black, as a lot of people seem to think it was, but it was because they disagreed with that policy and they believed it wasn't a constitutional exercise of power. So I, I think the problem is, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is that we've been uh, avoiding talking about the substance of the Tea Party. Every other Tea Party book avoids that 800 pound gorilla in the room. I wanted to talk to people about those constitutional principles that the Tea Partiers care so much about. Uh, and by you know distracting based on race, we, we avoid that, I think, more difficult conversation. Let's take some calls for you. Joshua is watching us in Long Island. And Joshua, you're on. Good afternoon. Joshua, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank, I just want to thank you for the programming this afternoon. I'm a regular listener of uh, Book TV and American History TV, and I quite enjoy it. Uh, I, you know, mm -hmm. I want to talk about uh, the Tea Party. I know you're, uh, you've spoken about uh, you know, some of the intellectual principles of the Tea Party, but I think you're, you're speaking a lot about some of the, the, the core policymakers. But then there are, I feel there's also this group of followers that kind of, without any intellectual rigor, kind of hear these buzzwords, you know, constitutionalism and small government, and just kind of follow along. And I think it's it's those are the those are the people that are make that are problematic with today's political, you know, uh, the lack of intellectual rigor in today's uh, political arena. I think they really don't know the issues. They don't know the specifics, and they're quite following along. And, and Sarah Palin's a paradigmatic example of that, that people blindly follow these buzzword policies and don't really know the specifics. And I think that's uh, really bringing our political system down to an unfortunate level. Yeah, I mean, obviously I would disagree with that. I, I don't know how many Tea Party events you've been to, but uh, the general format of the Tea Party events, and I've been to lots, uh, is that uh, they are basically sort of book clubs. Uh, they, they read the Federalist Papers, they read the Anti-Federalist Papers, they read uh, volumes of letters uh, by the founders uh, and, and more modern books such as mine. Um, and so I think they're trying very hard to educate themselves. Uh, and I, I think that they're probably better versed uh, than most Americans on the Constitution. And if you look at the polling data, the Tea Partiers actually are slightly better educated than the average American. So again, I think you're dealing more in stereotypes than actualities. Next is a call from Carl in Yonkers, New York. You're on, Carl. Okay. Ms. Foley? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I, I had a question for Ms. Foley. If, if she believed there was a salient moment in the genesis of the Tea Party movement, or did she feel that there was an underground that goes farther back than a single event or a single ramification in the twist between left and right, uh, old politics and new politics. Uh, it seems as if they've drawn much of their uh, spirit from, uh, as you say, from uh, earlier uh, constitutional precedents, earlier constitutional movements. But I also feel that there must have been an event, perhaps in the last 10 or 15 years, that really struck the verve to create the movement as uh, yes, you've written or as it expresses itself today. Uh, any comment, uh, Ms. Foley, on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think you make a lot of really good points. Uh, it seems to me, actually, that um, the genesis was, um, you know, the, the bailouts, uh, which actually started uh, at the end of the Bush administration, and uh, you saw some of the angst building 
uh, towards him, uh, and then President Obama took office, and uh, and then we had three or four more hundred plus billion dollar bailouts uh, that sort of added fuel to the.